Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Hi, I'm Cheryl Reynolds, and I'm with the UC Statewide IPM program. And welcome to the first UC Ag Expert Talk this year. And today's is on avocado thrips, invasion biology, and management. Peter Cusina is here with me, and he'll be running our polls and troubleshooting any technical problems. And please note that today's webinar is targeted to growers and pest management professionals. Master gardeners can certainly benefit from participating, but the pest management methods presented, especially the pesticides, are not to be followed without a clear understanding of their legal use by homeowners. And today's webinar is being recorded, so if you need to go back and listen to any part that you've missed, you can. The recording will be on the YouTube Ag Experts Talk playlist. However, the CEUs are only available for attending this live webinar now. And finally, we wanna say a special thank you to the Citrus Research Board for their support of this webinar series. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Mark Hoddle is an extension and biological control specialist in the Department of Entomology at UC Riverside. And today he will be speaking about avocado thrips, invasion biology and management. And so uh, Mark, now I'm gonna pass this over to you. So you can go ahead and share your slides. All right. All right. Can Thank you, you see my laser pointer? Yes. Yeah, okay, right. We're back on track. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Right. Okay. Start again. I'm wasting my valuable minutes. <laughs> okay, we're going to be talking about thrips biology and management. We'll have a brief overview of what thrips are, aspects of their biology, some of the control options, and then we'll drill down and focus on an invasive pest in California, the avocado thrips. Okay, so these are the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to provide an overview of thrips taxonomy. This will give us an idea of the types of insects that we are dealing with. And I'll take the opportunity here to uh, provide a very brief introduction to something that we call a lucid key. And this identifies approximately 300 thrips in California, uh, many of which you are not likely to encounter, but we also include a lot of pest species in this key and its name is the uh, Thysanoptera californica. If you want to link to this, you can just type it into Google and it'll come up. Uh, we'll cover thrips biology, aspects of their habits, life cycle, and the types of damage that they cause. And then we're going to drill down into the avocado thrips and the problems it's caused to the avocado industry in California. We'll briefly cover aspects of its invasion history, identification and how to sample for this insect, the types of damage that it causes, the effects of weather, especially hot weather, and the availability of flush growth in avocado orchards and how this drives avocado thrips outbreaks. Then we'll look at some control options. We'll touch on pesticides, cultural controls, and uh, I'll go over some work that we did looking at composted organic mulches for the suppression of thrips pupation rates underneath avocado trees. And we'll look at the efficacy of natural enemies for suppressing thrips populations in commercial orchards. And throughout this uh, presentation, we'll have some pop quizzes that are scattered and they'll come up and then you'll go through the, the online poll that you uh, were practicing with a little earlier. So what are thrips? Well, if you're not familiar with this group, they are insects. They have six legs, a pair of wings, antennae, three segmented body, head, thorax, and abdomen. And they belong to the order Thysanoptera. So that's a large group within the insects. And the derivation of Thysanoptera is fringe wings. If you look at this specimen I have mounted on a slide here, you can see the fine cilia or seti that are coming off the backs of the fore wings here and the setose looking uh, hind wings. So there are several um, orders within the suborder Terebranchia. And the Terebranchia is a very important suborder for us. All the females have these serrated overpositors, which they use to pierce uh, plant material, such as a leaf or maybe a fruit. And then that overpositor is pushed into the plant material and the eggs are deposited within the leaf. There are about eight families within the Terebranchia. Six of them you are never going to see. However, in an avocado orchard, you're likely to see two families quite commonly, the Aeolothripidae, these include the predatory species like Aeolothrips and Franklinothrips. These are ant mimicking species and they are quite important predators of avocado thrips. And then the family Thripidae. This includes avocado thrips in the genus Skirtothrips. 
and other pest species like Franklinia occidentalis. This is uh, the, the, the Western flower thrips. It's native to California, and this is a pest species you may be familiar with. So the other suborder within the Thysanoptera are the tubulifera. And they're easy to recognize because the back ends of both the males and the females have these tubes. And the females use those tubes for laying eggs. Some of these males may have secondary characteristics. This is our Bactrothrips, which is a native thrips in California. It fe feeds on fungus that infects dead oak leaves. That's all it feeds on. And within the tubulifera, there's one family, the Flaothripidae, and there are two, two um, subfamilies within this group, the Phalothropinae and the uh, Idolothropinae. Altogether, there's about 6,200 species of thrips that have been described, and they are enclosed in about 800 different genera spread across these two suborders, Terebranchia and the Tubulifera. So, if you're not familiar with these insects, they are extremely small. And if you are unable to identify them by sight, uh, some species you can identify readily just by looking at them. You don't need to slide mount them. Unfamiliar species need to be slide mounted. And this can get complicated because some genera, especially like Skirtothrips, including Skirtothrips persiae, the Avocadothrips, they have very high levels of morphological variation, especially the CT on the backs of the bodies, which are sometimes used for identifications. And this can be quite tricky if you're not an expert and have no familiarity with these types of morphological variations. A reminder, Thrips is used in the singular and the plural. It is like sheep. If you refer to a sheep, it's still a sheep. If you refer to many sheep, they're still sheep. So please, never call a thrips a thrip. <laughs> they're all thrips. Okay, so how do you identify these thrips? I'm just gonna give you a very, very brief overview of this very cool online identification key that we've developed called Thysanoptera californica. You can see the uh, URL down here if you want to um, get into it. We have co-opted the uh, seal from the great state of California, and it's very cool. And we put an Aolo thrips on the shield, on Athena's shield here. Okay, so some of the things that you'll see when you go to this website, you'll have an overview of the insect order Thysanoptera. You can see a screenshot here. The Lucid key, which we'll get to in a minute, is an open entry key. You do not have to work your way through it in any specific order. You answer the easiest questions first, and each time you answer a question, the program automatically eliminates any redundant features in the key that you do no longer need to answer. So how to operate, you can review that one. More importantly for us, there is a web page buried within this on how to collect and prepare thrips. Here is a screenshot giving you an instructions and ideas of the type of equipment that you need to collect thrips and how to go out uh, using a beet tray to sample four, four thrips. Once you've collected your thrips, we also have a page on how to prepare them for slide mounting, uh, macerating, getting them onto slides, drying the slides and labeling them. So this is uh, all the types of things you'd need to do if you are in a position where you have access to a lab and you need to slide mount thrips to identify them using this key. So now you've collected your thrips, you've slide mounted them, you're now ready to identify them. This is the section that we call identify thrips. This is the key. And basically the very first question you ask is, need to ask is, do your thrips have that ventral ovipositor or do they have a tube? And depending on whether you choose conical or tubular, that puts you into one of the two suborders, the terebranchia or the uh, tubulifera. And then you can answer any of these other questions through whatever order you want to. So maybe just say body color is an easy one for you, for you to answer because your thrips is black. You'd click on this and choose the color. Then any thrips that are not black are automatically pruned out of the key. And it is a very powerful way to quickly identify thrips. And the other thing I really like about this key that we've developed is that you are looking at actual photographs that we have taken of these specimens under the microscope and you're not looking at drawings. 
me, these visual representations are very helpful. I get confused when I look at drawings. So this is a great resource if you're interested in identifying thrips, learning more about them, how to go about collecting and slide mounting them. Just to remind you, thrips are tiny. This is the another native thrips to California. This is the bean thrips, Caliothrips fasciatus. It's sitting on a penny here. But to see the aspects of the body that you need for identifying this thrips, it needs to be slide mounted. This is a slide mounted female. You can see the hairs on the backs of the wings. You can see her ovipositor here. These would be useful things to use in the lucid key. Once they're slide mounted, you can use high magnification to look at uh, sculpturing between the ocelli on the forehead. That might be an important question you need to answer. You can look at sculpture and reticulation here on the pronotum. And you may even need to look at CT and reticulation and maybe even the fringe patterns on the abdominal segments of thrips to identify them. Once you've been able to uh, slide mount your thrips well, then you'll have uh, a really good strong chance of identifying those thrips using the lucid key Thysanoptera californica. Okay, so pop quiz number one. Let her rip, Peter. So approximately how many species of thrips have been identi identified and described? Fewer than 3,000 species, between 3,450 species, about 5,000 species, or more than 6,000 species have been identified and described. Wow, boy, that's great. Good job. People are paying attention. Oh, they're Googling the answers. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's pop quiz number two. With respect to pest management, which is the most accurate with respect to this statement? The most important suborder and family of thrips are the tubulifera and the idolothropini, the terebranchia and the aeolothropidae, Terebranchia and Thripidae, or the Terebranchia and the Melanthripidae. Mm, this might be a bit of a head scratcher. Okay, it's going to get closed out and bring up the All results. Right, let's see how you guys did. Oh, close, very close. Right. So the Terebranchia is correct. The Aeolothripidae contains the predators but it's the thripidae which contains the pest species that we need to manage. So for me, the most correct answer here is the terebranchia and the thripidae, because those are the pest species that you're going to need to identify if you're going to initiate uh, treatment programs. All right, but still you did pretty well. Okay, let's move on. So thrips biology, a microprimer. This is something that's always amazed me. Thrips have really weird mouth parts. Most insects have two mandibles. Oddly, thrips just have one mandible and it's the left mandible. So they have one tooth, which they basically use as a needle to pierce their food. So for example, if they're feeding on a leaf, they'll use that left mandible like a needle and they will stab the individual cells in the leaf and then they will suck up the juice that leaks out of those cells. For reasons that we don't really understand, the right mandible is resorbed during embryogenesis, but all other insects have two mandibles which they use for biting. Then part of the maxillae, which is another part of the uh, mouth parts, they're elongated and they form a stylet. And this stylet acts as a straw through which the foods are siphoned up. So the mandible is used to puncture the leaf or the fruit, the sap, the juice leaks out of it, and then a stylet is used to draw up that juice like a straw into the mouth where it is swallowed. So the majority of thrips are flower inhabiting and a lot of them feed almost exclusively on pollen. Two important genera you may have heard of are thrips and Frank Liniella. These are flower thrips and they live in these flowers feeding mainly on pollen. And I think something that we don't understand very well is that these flower inhabiting thrips, like thrip species and Frank Linealis, Frank Linealis species, they may actually be um, important pollinators in some crops. And we haven't really studied their pollination potential. So some species of thrips feed only on leaves. So for example, Scutothrips persiae, the avocado thrips, really likes to feed on young avocado leaves. 
The greenhouse thrips, heliothrips, hemorrhoidalis, which is also in avocado orchards, prefers feeding on the hardened older leaves and more mature fruit, especially fruit that are touching and they have a protective place to hide. Some species only feed on the hyphae of fungi or they will ingest whole fungal spores. This is uh, typical of the idolothripines in the uh, family Phleothripidae. Some species are predators and as you pointed out in the earlier poll, Aeolothrips are facultative predators. They're common in avocado orchards at certain times of the year. They'll feed on prey, but when prey is not available, they'll consume plant material and they will also feed on pollen. Some of these predatory thrips may only feed on meat, like the uh, six spotted thrips, Scolothrips six maculatus, which feeds on spider mites. Sex determination in thrips. Thrips may reproduce sexually or asexually. Sexual reproduction can take two forms. If a female lays fertilized eggs, those eggs become fer females. If she lays an unfertilized egg, those eggs will turn into males, and we refer to this as herenotoki. They can reproduce asexually where there's no mating involved, and in this case, the unfertilized eggs produce females only. There's no males in the population, and greenhouse thrips, heliothrips hemorrhoidalis, is an example of an asexual thrips which reproduces through a process that we refer to as thelotoki. And the reason why there are no males in the population is that Wolbachia removes males during embryogenesis, and that's a bacterium that's inside the uh, thrips. Some thrips exhibit uh, exaggerated sexual dimorphism, and this is a very cool thrips. Its name is Macro Ophthalmothrips argus. It's a, it's a non-native species that feeds on fungi, on dead wood, and we've collected this out of avocado orchards a few times. So up here you can see the female. Her forelegs are not really highly modified, but look at these legs on the male. They're like giant lobster claws. These must be used for fighting or guarding resources or maybe protecting male, uh, females from other males so they can't mate with her. Uh, we really know nothing about the function of these elaborate forearms in this thrips, and that would be a really cool thing to look at. Okay, the life cycle. This is a generalized thrips life cycle, and this is the type of life cycle that the avocado thrips has. So females lay their eggs inside plant tissue. And in, this, in the case of avocado thrips, they prefer to lay their eggs on the undersides of young leaves or in young fruit. Those eggs hatch. And then there are two larval stages, the first instar larva and the second instar larva. And these two immature stages feed on the leaf or they feed on the fruit. Once the second stage has finished its development, it gets ready to pupate, they will drop off the tree into the soil, and then they will enter the pro-pupil stage. And in this stage, when they molt, they develop these small little wing buds. And these pro-pupae don't move. They'll just sit there somewhat motionless. They'll then molt, shed their skin one more time. And oddly, and I don't know why this happens, but at this stage, the antennae fold back over the head. They look like handlebars on a, on a chopper bike. And you can see that the wings now have become larger. The wing buds have become larger. Then the pupa will shed its skin one more time. And then it'll emerge as a fully winged adult and it will fly up out of the soil and onto the tree where it will start feeding and reproducing again. Okay, time for pop quiz number three. Okay, so what is unusual about the mouth parts of thrips? They only have a right mandible. They only have two mandibles. They only have a left mandible. They have a stylet. Uh, Mark, while uh, we're giving people a chance to answer this, um, we did have a couple of questions okay. um, that I'll ask you. Sure. So um, one of the questions came in, uh, does the lucid key you have developed cover thrips beyond those found in the United States? Uh, no, it's only for thrips found in California but it can be used to identify thrips outside of California because uh, we have included species that are invasive and those non-native invasive thrips are found in other parts of the US and other countries as well. So it does have some utility outside of California, but the major focus has been on thrips of importance to California. Oh, very well, very nice, well done. 
That's great. They only have a left mandible. Cool. All right, let's go on to pop quiz number four. Thrips feed on a variety of different foods. The most common food for thrips is young green leaves, old green leaves, pollen, spider mites. And just one other question for you. Um, it was, what are Licinia? All right, so Licinia are, um, are modified parts of the maxillae. And in thrips, the Licinia are used to form a stylet. So they form a, a round -ish type tube. It looks a bit like a straw. And the buccal pump of the thrips is attached to this. That's basically the floor of the mouth which is very muscular and it can pump that up and down and that draws the fluids up through the stylet, which is formed by these Licinia. Okay, very good, well done. You guys are doing great. Thrips, the majority of thrips feed on pollen and then the, most, the second most common food source for them would be young green leaves. Well done, great. Okay, let's talk a bit about dispersal. So many species of thrips, they have fully developed wings. However, they're not really good flyers. They're very small. The musculature controlling the wings is not great, and the wings themselves are pretty flimsy. So often thrips get blown long distances by wind and storms, and there are sometimes a spectacular takeoffs of massive numbers of thrips during uh, thunderstorms. And in the UK, there's a common thrips called Lemothrips cerealium. It's a black thrips that infests uh, grasses and cereals. And they're referred to as thunderflies or thunderbugs in the, in the United Kingdom because of their mass flights during storms. And when this happens, they invade people's houses and they get into things like this Rolex watch, which stopped working and the watchmaker in uh, London pulled it apart. And he sent us these photos and it's like, what on earth are these things? And they were full of these little black limo thrips, uh, which had gone into the workings of the Rolex watch. And you can see how small they are here. Sometimes large numbers of them will invade houses, pack themselves into um, smoke detectors and set those off, for example. So, so quite a curious behavior. Some species, on the other hand, have very small wings, not really good for flying, but they are there. We refer to those thrips as being Brachypterus, having small wings. Well, some species like this Aptinothrips rufus, which you can find in, in California, it's a grass feeding species, has no wings at all. And we refer to this species as being Apterus. And it's almost been certainly moved around the world by humans, moving bales of hay and straw. The movement over long distances is human mediated. And this is really through the trade in live plants, undetected populations of thrips on nursery plants that come out of uh, Florida and into California, for example, resulted in the introduction of uh, Skirtothrips dorsalis, and an, an important agricultural pest in California, parts of California, and quite a serious pest of roses, especially out at the Huntington Gardens in Southern California. The economic importance of thrips. Thrips feeding can cause direct or indirect damage to the crop that's being fed on by these insects. So direct feeding damage results from, me from mechanical or chemical damage, such as enzymes that are, that are injected into the food source. And this uh, can cause damage to leaves, fruit, or flower buds. And this may result in deformed looking leaves. Maybe the leaves will appear silvered where the um, chlorophyll has been extracted out of the leaves. Or well, the leaves may look really dirty because of the fecal droplets that have been left on them. And the feeding damage is heavy, and we have observed this with avocado thrips, you may get premature leaf or fruit drop. Indirect damage, on the other hand, results from the transmission of plant pathogens, especially viruses during feeding. So for example, Tospo viruses are spread by Frank Liniella and thrips species. And these are particularly problematic in tomatoes, for example, or um, capsicum crops, or even in, um, in patians and greenhouses. And once infected with these Tospo viruses, plants die, they develop these necrotic spill spots, or they may exhibit severe levels of wilting. So here's an example of direct fe feeding damage. This is caused by Clambothrips myoporae on uh, myoporum plants in Southern California. So myoporum is not native to California, it's from Australia and New Zealand. And Clambothrips is an invasive species that was accidentally introduced into California from Tasmania. 
And you can see the direct feeding damage here that the leaves have become highly dis deformed through the feeding of larval and adult thrips. And on the more mature leaves where they have been feeding, you can see the silvering that's occurred and a lot of fecal droplets on the top of the leaf. So back in 2006, I went out to some onion fields around Palmdale and Lancaster, and these onion fields were heavily infested with Thrips tabassi, and it was spreading a viral um, pathogen called the iris yellow spot virus in these onion plants. And you can see the yellowing lesions in these um, leaves on the onion plants, and the die-offs in these onion fields were spectacular, virtually 100% kill um, by this pathogen that was being spread by the onion thrips, thrips tabassi. Pop quiz number five. Which statement is true? Thrips are strong flyers. All thrips have wings. Humans move thrips long distances. Thrips only fly during thunderstorms. Do we have any more questions? We do. We have one. Um, okay. So this is from David and he asks, can cold temperature make the thrips less active or kill them? And then um, an example of California winter temps in the 30s. Right, yes. So uh, cool temperatures can certainly slow thrips down, but it has to get really cold to kill them. And if it gets cold enough to kill them, it's probably going to be cold enough to kill your plants. Especially if you're dealing with subtropical crops like uh, citrus and avocados. Brilliant. Well done. Yes, humans move thrips long distances, often accidentally through uh, the trade in live ornamental plants, for example. Well done. Okay, let's pop quiz number six. And hopefully that photo will stay there and then we can see the questions. There you go. The circular thrips feeding damage on the top of this orange, and I'm just highlighting with the little laser pointer here, and you can see some other scarring running down the side of the, the fruit, is a result of direct feeding damage by thrips, indirect feeding damage, or it's calyx burn, <clears throat> where the wind was blowing the immature fruit back and forth and the calyx was rubbing on the skin of the orange. Well done, very good. Yes, it's direct feeding damage and that was caused by the citrus thrips, skirto thrips citri. Well done. Okay, let's move on. Let's get into avocado thrips, skirto thrips persiae. It's in the family Thripidae and it's a terebranchian thrips. First discovered in California in 1996 around Port Wainimi in Ventura County and Irvine in Orange County. It was very similar to specimens that were first found on smuggled avocado trees that originated from Oaxaca in southern Mexico, and they were intercepted at the Port of San Diego in 1971. Those thrips were slide mounted and they sat in the USDA museum and nobody really paid any attention to them until avocado thrips blew up in Southern California. And then Steve Nakahara with USDA went back and looked at those specimens and concluded that that thrips from Oaxaca was probably the same species that had now established in Southern California. And it was named in 1997, the avocado thrips, Scudo thrips persiae. So in California at least, and in other areas where I've collected it, this thrips seems to be really specific to avocados. We have not found it feeding on any other species of plant in California. And our subsequent sampling work determined that this insect is native to parts of Mexico and Guatemala. So the type of damage that you'll see on avocados is caused by direct feeding damage, which is done by in, uh, thrips larvae and thrips adults. So in this instance, you can see a mature avocado leaf that is heavily scarred on the underside. And this is the result of feeding damage that occurred to this leaf when it was young and tender. And then as the leaf matured, the scars expanded out and permanently damaged the undersurface of this, of this leaf. Here is a small avocado fruit hanging in a tree its surface has been completely damaged by feeding larvae and feeding adults. So that is referred to as alligator skin. And here on these more mature avocados, you can see elongated thrips damage, feeding damage here. This probably occurred when the thrips um, were feeding on fruit that was small. Then as the fruit expanded, the scar material hardened up and then it just elongated along the surface of the fruit as the fruit matured. And you can almost see like a calyx pattern here where they were probably underneath the calyx feeding on that immature fruit. <clears throat> now 
So back at the height of the thrips infestation levels, you can see the culls coming out of here in the, in the packing house. Lots of brown avocados dropping into this bin. They were packed and sold as papacados. So basically these brown avocados went into the uh, guacamole business. And the trade name was, looks bad, but tastes good. So there was no damage to the inside of these fruits. The outsides just were heavily scarred, alligator skinned, and looked like potatoes or papacados. So when we went, Phil Phillips and I, uh, he was an, ex, an IP, area or IPM advisor in Ventura County. So Phil and I spent a lot of time in Mexico, Central America, and, and the Caribbean looking for avocado thrips because we wanted to figure out where this insect had come from. It was an undescribed species when it showed up in California. So Phil and I went through Mexico, Guatemala, down into Costa Rica, through the Caribbean, collecting thrips off avocados. We slide mounted them all, identified them, and we determined that avocado thrips is found here in Michoacan and Urapan, all the way down through here into the highlands of central Guatemala. When we got down into Costa Rica, Scurdothrips persiae, the avocado thrips, was replaced by a different species of Scurdothrips, Scurdothrips astrictus. And I've collected a different species of Scurdothrips again on avocados in Colombia. So there appears to be a complex of Scurdothrip species associated with avocados in parts of the native range of this plant. So using DNA analyses, we determined that California's invading population of avocado thrips came from this place, Cuatapecarenas. It's a plant, it's an avocado breeding center in Mexico. And I suspect somebody from California went to Cuatapecarenas, saw some type of avocado there that they liked, which you couldn't get in California. They smuggled the plant material back to California. It was infested with avocado thrips. And that was how the uh, resulting infestation and invasion occurred in California. So these thrips are native to the highlands of um, Mexico and Guatemala and the temperatures in those areas tend to be quite temperate. And what we have seen with avocado thrips is that feeding pressure in thrips populations tend to be greatest where temperatures are relatively cool year round, especially within one to five miles of the coast. And then the pestiferousness or the levels of damage that you see on avocado thrips decline significantly as you move inland where temperatures become hotter. So this thrips from the highlands of central Mexico and Guatemala was really pre-adapted to the cool prevailing climates of California's coastal avocado growing areas. And it really doesn't like the hotter interior desert areas because those temperatures are just unfavorable for its survival. And we have tracked the population dynamics of avocado thrips through time, and we've compared that with temperature. So here in yellow, you can see avocado thrips densities on avocado leaves through time. And then in red, you can see the temperature over the course of a year. So when temperatures go up, avocado thrips populations go down. When temperatures are low, avocado thrips like low temperatures and their population densities increase again. Temperatures go up thrips populations go down to low levels. Okay, so pop quiz number seven. Which of the following is most correct? Avocado thrips is native to California and feeds on avocados, citrus and cherimoyas. Avocado thrips is native to Argentina and it feeds on avocados and cassava. Avocado thrips is native to Mexico and feeds only on avocados. Avocado thrips is a species complex and its native range is not determined. Well done, yes, avocado thrips is native to Mexico and at least in California and in Mexico and Guatemala, we've only found it feeding on avocados. So as avocado growers, what concerns you most is protecting the crop, the fruit from attack by, by avocado thrips. So one question we needed to answer was, well, what size fruit do avocado thrips prefer to feed on? And what size fruit do females prefer to lay their eggs in? And to do this, we collected thousands of small fruit, medium sized fruit and large fruit from avocado orchards that were infested with avocado thrips, put them in these trays, put the trays in these incubating cabinets. Then every day I pulled them out and I counted the number of thrips that were on each of these fruits of different sizes. And these are the data that we came up with. I collected uh, 1,600 fruit. I collected all, I counted almost 12,000 thrips larvae. And you can see that there is a definite pattern to the data here. The thrips prefer to lay their eggs in fruit of a certain size. 
And fruit lengths of about one to 2.5 inches are most preferred for overposition. Therefore, these stages are gonna be most vulnerable to damage. However, you, if you're going to think about control, implementing controls, you probably want to put those controls on before you reach these most vulnerable stages. So treatments would need to be put on in advance of the most vulnerable fruit stages being reached. And you might wanna think about doing some of those uh, control treatments or at least getting them lined up when fruit are less than one inch in length. So where else do they lay their eggs? So we looked at uh, leaf petioles, the tops of young leaves, the bottoms of young leaves, thick green stems, thin green stems, and mature fruit, which you just saw, and fruit petioles. And avocado thrips really prefer to lay their eggs in two different places. The bottoms of young leaves, that is the flush growth that's still that orangey, uh, reddish color or light green before they harden off and become mature and inside the immature fruit. So about 60% of the thrips that we have read out came from the bottoms of young leaves and about 33% of thrips that we have read out come from immature fruit. Okay, so let's go on to pop quiz number eight. Avocado thrips prefer to lay their eggs in fruit petioles and green stems, mature fruit, immature leaves, or the undersides of immature leaves and small fruit. And we did have a question come in. Okay. It's uh, why not plant a row of the desirable avocado size to attract the thrips away from the other larger ones? Right. Um, I boy that. That could be a very difficult trap crop to um, to implement in your orchard, and you'd also be uh, providing a breeding substrate for those thrips. So that's something I probably would not consider doing. If the avocado thrips fed on a different species of plant altogether, and it really liked that different species of plant, and I'll just say something crazy like, just say it really liked garlic, for example. Planting garlic as a trap crop in your orchard would be, would be a good idea. But planting other types of avocados to pull uh, avocado thrips away from avocados is probably not going to work that well. Okay, let's see how folks did. Well done, that's right. The undersides of immature leaves and small fruit. Okay, good job, let's move on. So how do you protect your fruit from thrips attack? So protecting fruit from thrips may involve the following steps. But before you decide to do anything, you need to know how to monitor for avocado thrips and how to estimate their densities. You cannot implement any control measures unless you know the thrips are in the orchards and at what types of densities they're at and if those densities have reached levels that are going to cause economic damage. This is all about money. There is no point putting on treatments if you don't have the pest or the pests are at too low a density to be concerned about. So there are several options available for control, pesticides, using natural enemies, and cultural control. And we're gonna talk about all of these in, in, in the next few minutes. Monitoring for avocado thrips. Thrip sampling typically relies on some of the following. Uh, the use of colored sticky cards, especially yellow cards, very common in greenhouses, but extremely limited practical use in the field and I don't recommend this. You can go out and visually inspect leaves and fruit for the presence of thrips, or you can use the beet sampling method where you bang the foliage over a white tray, for example, and you count the number of thrips that fall on to that beet tray. I prefer this method, it's easy to do, and uh, you can catch a lot of thrips on your beet tray and you're not looking at lots and lots of small leaves. So, Wee Yi, he was based out of uh, Ben Faber's and uh, Phil Phillips's lab in Ventura County. He'd go out to an orchard and he came up with this sampling method. He'd look at 10 leaves on 10 different trees and the idea would be you look at 10 trees that are randomly spaced throughout the orchard and quite widely separated. And you'd go out when those trees have immature leaves on them because this is the stage that the avocado thrips will be feeding on. But what's really important here is that as those young leaves harden off in the orchard, the thrips are going to move off of those leaves. And if there are immature fruit that are within that vulnerable size range, they will move on to those immature fruit to feed and that will result in scarring and that will result in economic damage. Here's an example of sticky cards that we put out in orchards. 
avocado throats really loves yellow sticky cards, but they're incredibly hard to identify when they're stuck in the gunk. This is Dave Kellum. He was with the, uh, the San Diego Ag Commissioners, Commissioner's Office. He's the entomologist down there. We're out looking at avocado leaves. So Dave's doing the visual sampling. As you can see, he's got Superman vision. He doesn't need any magnifying gear. Here's me beat sampling the leaves onto a tray. I've got my magnifying lens around my, my neck here. So if I see something of interest, I can open up the lens and have a look at it, try and identify it that way. But all of this has been covered by Benny Faber out of Ventura County. And Ben's with uh, UCANR and UCIPM have put together a really nice YouTube video on how to sample for avocado thrips and avocado orchards. And if you want to uh, take a shot of that U URL, you should go to the YouTube channel and, and check it out. He did a really nice job on that. Okay, so you know how to go out to sample for thrips now we need to cover something that we call an action threshold. This is the density of thrips that's going to trigger a treatment. And the action threshold should be set at such a level that you have time to react before economic damage starts to build up in the orchard. So you need to monitor larval densities on immature leaves while fruit set is going on. And we came up with these uh, recommendations. So when you see an average of about three to five thrips larvae per immature leaf during fruit set, this will result in around six to 15% economic damage. That is, that percentage of fruit will end up with some level of scarring on them. If you're out in the orchard and you're seeing around half a thrips to one and a half larvae per immature fruit, that's gonna result in a lot of damage. About 20 to 50% of your fruit will exhibit scarring. The most critical time period for being out scouting for avocado thrips is October through December. And fruit are going to be most susceptible to feeding damage when they're less than one inch in length. And we discussed the reasoning for that in an earlier slide. So to minimize feeding damage, uh, we Yi and Phil and Ben recommended that um, you should try to implement your treatments when thrips densities are less than five per leaf on average. Top quiz number nine. Monitoring avocado thrips relies on visual sampling. When assessing initiation of controls, which of the following need consideration? You need to monitor densities of thrips on young and old leaves only. Densities of thrips on immature leaves only. Presence of immature fruit less than one and a half inches long or densities of thrips on immature leaves and the presence of small immature fruit in the orchard. And there is a couple of questions that came in. Um, okay. First one is which varieties of avocados are likely or more likely to have thrips? For example, Haas, Gwen, or Mexicola? Right, so um, all the work we have done have been on Haas and we know that Haas is very sensitive to avocado thrips. Um, I don't think we've done any studies on like um, on other cultivars like Gwen, Mexicola, Bacon, Fuerte, for example. So I can't really answer those questions, but Hass is the predominant variety that's grown, and it's uh, highly attractive, not only to avocado thrips, but also to Persea mite, another non-native pest from Mexico that we have to manage in our orchards. Okay, how do folks do? Well done, that's right. Immature leaves in the presence of small immature fruit need to be present together. Great, good job. Okay, let's move on. So control options, pesticides. Everybody uses pesticides to some degree, I assume for controlling avocado thrips. There are several here that are quite um, popular, especially abamectin, it has a residual activity of around one to two months. Sabadilla was the first pesticide we got registered for avocado thrips, but it is a weak pesticide. It has residual activity of only around one to two weeks. Another com product I think is quite popular is the use of spinosad. It has a residual a activity of around two to four weeks. And if you mix in, it in with a horticultural oil or a surfactant, you may increase the uh, residual activity there. And Danitol too is a contact insecticide that's um, very non-specific and there may be some risk of secondary pest outbreaks using Danitol. Uh, neonicotinoids have been looked at by Frank Byrne down here at UC Riverside. Imidacloprid, when it's put on, appears to give about 12 weeks of residual activity against avocado thrips. 
But the other neonics like thymophoxan, clothianidin, and denatifuran are less than four weeks of residual activity. And I don't think Frank really pursued much uh, work with these because of their uh, short residual times. Okay, so here are the disclaimers about pesticides. Resistance development. We're very concerned about the overuse of abamectin. And when we were doing a lot of work with Sabadilla, within the two or three years that we were using Sabadilla in orchards, for example, we saw um, quantifiable increased tolerance to Sabadilla by avocado thrips. So avocado thrips is a skirto thrips is in a group of thrips which are notorious for developing resistance to insecticides. The other thing about the use of insecticides, especially something like Danitol, is that you could get secondary pest outbreaks. This occurs when the natural enemies are killed off and pests that are normally under good biological control now, be, now may become problematic in your orchards and they may need treatment. Or you can get resurgence, whereas the pesticide knocks down the target pest, the natural enemies are removed, and then the pest comes back to even higher densities. And of course, uh, broad spectrum insecticides like Danitol or other products similar to that will kill the beneficials in your orchards as well. Uh, there's a really nice web page that you can visit through this URL down here, which will list the different types of insecticides that you could consider for using against avocado thrips in avocado orchards. So let's look at biological control. So when we were doing a lot of work on this, um, we, were, we were working with insectary companies and we commercialized this predatory thrips, Frank, Lin, Frank Lino thrips Vesperformis. You can see it looks like an ant. And this thrips responds quite strongly to avocado thrips outbreaks in citrus orchards. We also looked at releases of commercially available lacewing larvae. Our conclusion after two to three years of work with the predatory thrips and the lacewing larvae was that, was that augmentative biocontrol, that is releases of these commercially available natural enemies just simply were not effective in terms of their impact or the economics of purchasing them and releasing them into orchards. A different approach could be conservation biological control where you take measures to preserve your resident natural enemies to maximize levels of free pest control. And this could be really important if you want to get the maximum services provided by generalist predators like Frank Linothrips vesperformis or Frank Linothrips erisabensis and these species of lacewings like Chrysoperla, for example. And that may just be simply modifying your pesticide application regimens, planting flowering crops somewhere in your orchards to provide nectar and pollen for these natural enemies to feed on. So then they can feed on those resources and then move back into the orchard to attack the pests that are feeding on the avocado trees. So another option that we looked at was cultural control. And I was quite curious to see whether or not composted organic yard waste could provide some suppression of avocado thrips. Composts have, a, have you know, very well documented benefits, root rot control, water retention, improved soil fertility, weed suppression, and improved plant growth. But I was interested in whether or not they could be used for thrips control. And the reason for this we'll come back to the thrips life cycle is that you hopefully you remember that these second instar larvae drop off the tree and they fall into the soil to pupate well we did studies that indicated about 77 percent of the thrips larvae will fall into the soil the remaining 23 percent will find little nooks and crannies on the avocado tree to crawl into to pupate and of those that drop from the tree, about 75% of them land almost directly under the branch which had the leaves or fruit on in which they were feeding. So they really just do literally just drop straight down. If there's a bit of wind, they might get blown away a little bit, but the majority of them will go straight underneath the tree where they're feeding. So we did some experiments where we had these top work trees flushing heavily, loads of avocado thrips on them. We put out mulches under some trees, other trees were not mulched, and then we put these boxes underneath the trees. The clear panel was covered with tanglefoot on the upper side and the lower side. So thrips larvae that were dropping out of the trees landed on the upper side of the panel, and any thrips adults that were emerging up out of the soil would get stuck on the underside of the panel as they flew up towards the light and they tried to reach the tree. We took out the panels and we would count the numbers of thrips larvae on the tops of the panels, the numbers of thrips adults on the underside of the panels. There was no difference in the numbers of thrips falling out of the trees in the mulch plots and in the unmulched plots. 
where we did see a significant difference was in the numbers of adult thrips that were emerging out of those different treatments. Significantly fewer thrips would emerge out of plots that had mulch underneath those trees. And we think the reason for that is, is that that composted organic mulch created a micro environment that was swarming with generalist predators. None of them were specific to avocado thrips, but they would readily feed on thrips pupae and larvae when they encountered them in the mulch. This biodiversity was largely lacking under avocado trees that lacked that mulch. Pop quiz number 10, this is the last one. What do you consider the best approach to managing avocado thrips? Biocontrol only, augmentative releases of natural enemies and conservation biocontrol. Pesticides only, applications are timed when pest densities reach appropriate levels and immature fruit need protecting. Cultural control only, use of mulches for suppressing thrips pupation rates under trees. Or all of the above, develop and implement a full IPM program and integrate efficacious aspects of biological control, pesticides and cultural control. Okay, well done, that's it. Yes, try to use many different control tactics as possible. And I got one last slide. No, just go to that now. Got any questions? You might want to look at the uh, IPM management manual for avocados that was put out by um, UC IPM. It's a beautiful book. Got a lot of great stuff in there. So the first one was, um, are there multiple generations per year or only one generation? Uh, right, that's a great question. Yes, avocado thrips can probably have about two generations per year. And that number could be variable depending on temperature and the availability of flush and young fruit on trees. Okay, and then the next question is, how many weeks of protection is typically required? Uh, right, so that can be a little tricky to, to guess. And again, that could be temperature uh, and climate driven. So some years we've had cool, cool periods for extended uh, time, and that's allowed these thrips populations to build up to quite high levels before the heat came on and the uh, temperatures increased and the leaves and fruit reached sizes that were no longer susceptible to damage. So I think typically what the industry has preferred to do is to go for some of these insecticides if that's what you're going to be using, which have long residual activity. And then part of the trick with that has been trying to determine um, the optimal, not only the optimal time of application, but if you are going to have applicators applying these products for you, such as a, a maybe using a helicopter to do hillsides, part of what you need to figure into your treatment plan is what is the wait time for getting those crews into your orchards to apply those uh, products, for example. So there are a few things that need to be considered here. The temperature, the availability of young leaves, overlapping with uh, immature fruit, and then whether or not you do in-house treatments or whether you need to contract those treatments out and bring folks in to do the job for you. So all those affect the time. Timing and then that also may affect the, uh, depending on what types of products you use, that'll affect the uh, residual activity that you'll get from those products as well. Okay, um, there is a question of about neonicotinoids, why would you consider neonics when we know they are killing our bee populations yeah. and when other countries are banning specific neonics? Yeah, that's right. So um, we're not really recommending people use neonicotinoids. I was just putting that out there as a class of insecticides that we have looked at for potential for the control of avocado thrips. So you're quite right. If you're very concerned about uh, the non-target impacts on bees or other organisms in your orchards, then this is a product you should be uh, steering away from. And like you mentioned, you know, if resi residues are a concern and that's going to be affecting export potential, then that's a class of insecticide you should definitely be staying away from. So yeah, we're not recommending anything. I was just laying out what's been looked at and what the efficacy of those products um, has been based on the experiments we've done down here. Okay, and the next one, um, what about inundative releases of parasitic wasps as a biocontrol option? Yeah, so we have no good parasitoids for avocado thrips. So um, there is one thrip species that uh, parasitoid that goes after thrips. It's a thripobia species, but it's 
in the field, when we have um, read out thrips larvae, the attack rates are less than 1%. And it's a generalist thrips parasitoid, and it's not really focused on avocado thrips. So we have no good thrips parasitoids, and none are commercially available. And it's not an option that we can consider looking at, unfortunately. Okay, and then um, someone wants to know about the use of pheromones uh, with color traps. Right, so thrips don't have pheromones, so that's something we, well, that's not true. Some thrips have pheromones, but they are active over extremely short distances, probably less than an inch or two. And therefore there'd be no um, benefit to putting those pheromones on a uh, sticky card to attract them. And of the pheromones that we do know about, they tend to be used for defensive re, um, purposes or during um, very close up uh, courtship behaviors. And most of that work's been done in Western flower thrips. And I'm unaware of any studies that have been done on species of skirto thrips looking at pheromones. So that's another um, aspect of the biology of these insects that's not really helpful from a management perspective. Okay, and then um, are there any effective systemic pesticides available? Yes, yeah, so there are some effective systemics and imidacloprid was one <laughs> that, we, uh, that we just discussed. And uh, there are other products that have translaminar activity. They're not truly systemic. They don't move through the tree. So abamectin, for example, if it's mixed with um, a narrow range horticultural oil, something like say a 415 horticultural oil, that oil will help the abamectin move inside the leaf. But once it's inside the leaf, it doesn't move through the plant. So I think the only true systemics that we have um, shown to have activity are the neonicotinoids, and uh, with in particular uh, imidacloprid seems to be somewhat effective as far as translocation, not only in terms of translocation, but in terms of residual activity as well. Okay, the next question is, what are organic treatments for thrips? Oh, yes, okay, right. Um, ah, that's embarrassing. Um, I should be able to answer that off the top of my head, and unfortunately, I cannot. If anybody attending can type the answer into that, into the chat, that would be really useful, and I should look that up and um, get that into a revised set of slides. Okay, and then there is a question. Um, what would you recommend for backyard orchardists? Would you recommend starting with cultural col uh, control first and then a year later, if not better than spinosad? Yes, yeah, so for backyard growers, when I get queries about avocado thrips, the advice I have for them is that you don't really need to do anything. If you end up with some cosmetic damage to your fruit, it's going to be superficial and limited to the skin only, and it's not going to affect the quality of the of the uh, edible part of the avocado. And it seems now that avocado thrips sort of settled down in the environment and we don't see the ex you know, insanely high levels of fruit scarring that we saw originally when the thrips first invaded back in the uh, late 1990s. Okay, one, um, one came in the chat was in trust, and then yes, one is sab Sabadilla? Yes, yeah, Sabadilla, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yep, that's right. So we mentioned about Sabadilla, you need to mix that with sugar, and its residual activity is very low, two to three weeks. And I think when we looked at in trust, again, a lot of these organically approved compounds just have somewhat low residual activity. Is in trust the spinosad product? Somebody, I... I I can't open up my computer to have a look, so I have the slideshow running on it right now. I think, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yes. Yes, it is, okay. And then, um, so we have another question. What controls them in their native countries, uh, Mexico and Guatemala? Uh, that's a great question. So the whole, one of the major reasons Phil Phillips and I spent so much time in Mexico, Guatemala, other countries in Central America and the Caribbean was to look for natural enemies of avocado thrips. And unfortunately, we did not find any good natural enemies. And I think avocado thrips is like a lot of thrips, pests around the world is that they're not really regulated to any um, significant level by predators or parasites. They're more under the control of 
their populations are more likely to be suppressed by unfavorable environmental conditions like we see with avocado thrips when it gets too hot the populations crash really fast and then the disappearance of their preferred food so once leaves harden off in the environment and the fruit get too big their populations crash because there's nothing around for them to feed on and because thrips are so explosive in their population growth we refer to them as boom and bust species that predators and other types of natural enemies like fungal diseases, for example, don't have enough time to respond to those massive population outbreaks before they disappear again. So as targets for biological control, especially natural enemies that we would bring in from overseas to use in a classical or introduction biological control program, thrips are just really poor targets for that type of population regulation. Okay, I think we just have a couple of comments um, left, so I'll just read those to you. Um, one was Sabadilla also benefits greatly by acidic tank mix pH. Uh, yes, thank you. That's correct. Thank you very much. And then the final comment is I use water as my main treatment periodically. Now we'll be yes. sure to do when fruit is small. Yes, yeah, that's something we've done for white flies as well. Um, we've demonstrated that on especially when giant whitefly was a big problem on avocado trees, we'd just recommend you go with a high pressure hose and just blast them off the leaves. And that worked as well as the insecticide treatments that we were evaluating. So yeah, that's a good control option. Just have to make sure you don't blast off all your little BBs <laughs> that are hanging on the trees. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so I think you've answered everything. Thank you. Yeah, so just to go back to Sabadilla, it used to be marketed in California as Veritran D. I see somebody's just asked that. Yeah, so Sabadilla is an alkaloid extract from the seed of a plant. And it's marketed as Veritran, V-E-R-A-T-R-A-N hyphen D, Veritran D. And one of the, the funny things about this, when we were trying to get this registered in California, because it needs to be mixed with sugar, uh, the sugar is a feeding stimulant for the avocado thrips. We actually had to get sugar registered for application on avocados in California. <laughs> Might poison somebody with too much sugar. Okay, it looks like our activity is slowing down. And I just want to thank you, Mark, for presenting today. Oh, you're welcome. It's been fun. I enjoyed it. It's great not have to drive four hours to give an extension presentation. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, it was a very good presentation. And um, so thank you. And uh, thank everybody for attending. We had uh, quite a few people today. Yep, that's super. Thank you, everybody, for your time. And um, hopefully we can do another one of these in the future.